Okay, folks, again, welcome um, to this Deer and Capri event um, called Protect Your Flock. Um, just so you know, um, we are recording the event, um, and the purpose of recording the event is that we can use it, uh, post it on the Deer and Capri websites for a future use and sharing around um, people who may not be able to attend. And I suppose I'm a, a little bit of a thought here that um, we're, we're heading towards over 450 participants here now. So, um, if each person here tells five people, then that gets it up. That gets up to uh, seven hundred and fifty people. So, Sharon, Sharon, the the, the good message that you that you hear here tonight with your friends and family who might also um, be uh, bird keepers um, will will be very helpful in uh, getting that message. Um, so, let me introduce myself first. My name's um, Jim Lee, and I'm the deputy director of Animal Health and Welfare Policy um, in the department, and. One of the primary responsibilities is epigenetic disease control policy. Um, the objective and purpose of our webinar tonight is to, is to discuss the threat of bird flu, flu and, importantly, what steps um, you can take um, on your individual flocks and, and, your, and your individual um, premises to stop your birds um, getting sick. So, a little bit of housekeeping before we get going. Um, people are watching through WebEx tonight. Um, and doing this through WebEx, there's a Q&A section at the bottom. So it's at the bottom right of your screen. So not the chat, but the Q&A, because we'll, we'll be able to record the questions. Um, and, and any questions that we don't get to tonight, we'll be able to provide answers afterwards. So you use the Q&A function from now, really, any questions, and we'll gather them up at the end. And I'll ask the, the panel those questions. To say any questions not answered, then we'll take away and publish a document afterwards um, along with the uh, recording. I want to thank the panel um, for their time tonight. Um, we have a, an extensive panel here of colleagues from both um, DERA um, and from uh, private practice um, who, will, who will be on hand to answer um, the most difficult questions that uh, you can present in relation to uh, protecting your flock. And also thank the panel for the time they took to prepare in advance. So our speakers tonight, um, Chief Veterinary Officer Robert Hughes, going to do a brief welcome shortly. Um, we also have Ignatius McJohn, who's going to give us a sort of current picture, an overview of um, avian influenza as, as we stand. Then Caroline Hall from Parkland's Veterinary Practice um, is going to do a short summary on signs and symptoms before handing over to Dana Simpson from St. David's Poultry Veterinary Practice, who will provide us some tips on how best to protect your flock from bird flu, and, and also some tips on effectively housing your birds or keeping them otherwise separate from wild birds, as is required since Monday past, but we'll talk a little bit more about that. Then finally, for the Q&A, Laura Wilson, a dear veterinary officer and our poultry Subject matter expert will give us uh, a brief summary and some take home messages before we start off with the QA. So that's as far as housekeeping and welcome introductions goes. Um, hand over to yourself now, Robert, um, the Chief Veterinary Officer. Just a brief welcome, if you will. Oh, a picture of me. That's scary. So thanks everyone for giving of your time to be here tonight. This is really important. It's really important to the poultry sector and to everybody who keeps birds, whether backyard or pets, um, that we get this information out um, to those who can take meaningful actions against it. And that's what tonight's about. Avian influenza, bird flu is here. Um, it's much, much earlier than we would normally expect. It's a fortnight earlier than it had reached GB last year and much, much earlier than it than it came onto this island. Um, so we are really quite concerned about the health and welfare and safety of our national flock here in Northern Ireland. We know it's here because there are already 25 infected premises in GB. There's two down south in the Republic of Ireland. Uh, and as, in addition to that, there's been something like 180 findings of wild birds in GB, about th across 30 sites, 19 different species. Um, but 50 findings of wild birds, uh, positive wild birds in Ireland, five here. So there's no question that the disease is here. And all the evidence is, is that the infection, uh, the weight of infection in the environment is really quite high. So what we're going to talk about tonight is how to try and keep this disease out 
and practical things that you can do to protect your own flock and by doing so protect the industry. If we do get bird flu in, in Northern Ireland, it will have severe economic effect on the sector, but I don't estimate, uh, underestimate either the emotional effect it has on both farm families and people who keep birds uh, either for a hobby or, or as pets. Um, the, the effect this can have on all is, can be devastating. So it's important that we all do everything we can in order to protect our individual birds and our national flock. Please use question and answer as you go along. Um, don't don't wait until typing in questions at the end, and then we'll try and get it few, through as many as we can at the end. So thanks, Jim. Back to you. Thanks, Robert, um, for that um, introduction. Um, we're just going to hand over now to Ignatius McKeown, um, Dear Divisional Veterinary Officer, um, with uh, has a range of responsibilities, but um, one of the main ones is episodic disease control, um, and he's going to give us a overview of the disease and the picture across um, Europe and these islands. Thanks, Ignatius. Oh, good afternoon, everyone, uh, and uh, welcome to the, the, the webinar. I suppose the first thing we need to ask is, what is avian influenza? So it's a, a flu, which is mainly a, a disease of birds. Because it's a flu, it is very infectious, and there are many different strains of avian influenza. The strains are differentiated uh, by the letters H and N. Basically, it's the strain that is present here is known as highly pathogenic H5N1. And uh, basically, that's a strain which occurs in uh, GB in Ireland and across mainland Europe. So the important thing about avian flu is that it is a very infectious and very infectious disease uh, causes high mortality, uh, uh, causes loss of production, and also has a major effect on our trade in poultry meat and poultry eggs. Uh, our trading partners basically have a major concern in relation to whether we are affected with uh, avian influenza or not. There is a very, very low risk of avian influenza affecting people. Its main effect is on other birds. It can also affect some other animals, such as pigs. But as I say, its main effect, and I think the important point to realize about avian influenza is that its main effect is on poultry. Next slide, please. So the current situation, uh, Robert has already mentioned that there have been cases in GB, currently 25 of them, uh, and there are several cases in the south of Ireland as well. The cases in GB have affected backyard flocks uh, and commercial poultry. And at this time of the year, they have affected many uh, commercial turkey farms as well. It seems to have a predilection for, uh, for uh, affecting turkeys. And in some cases, the mortality in those houses can reach between 60 and 80 percent. And if you consider the uh, if you consider what that looks like, it's absolutely devastating uh, for the owners and uh, for everyone that has to deal with it. So it's a pretty devastating disease. It has a major effect on the individuals uh, involved in the process and again has major trade implications. So we can see there from the, from the map uh, on that particular slide where the majority of the outbreaks are happening. And you can see across GB, basically, the Robert has already talked about the number of wild bird settings. If you look at the island of Ireland, basically, you can see again the number of wild bird settings and where they have occurred on the uh, positive cases. Uh, and if you look at the map, you will see the predominance of cases along uh, the North Sea and Scandinavia. Those countries have been very badly affected with the avian influenza, whereas, where it has affected both the wild bird populations and the commercial poultry. And from what I can gather, the majority of people watching this are 
owners of backyard flocks, again, as I say, it can also affect backyard flocks as well, causing high mortality in those flocks. It is a very distressing disease for all, for all involved. There is another major focus, again, whenever you look at the map, you can see there in northern Italy. Now, it, this is interesting from a scientific point of view in that basically we've got major outbreaks in the north of Europe and also, bit, uh, also in the south of Europe. The north of Italy is where the majority of commercial poultry is kept in Italy. And again, as I say, it's a confluence of a confluence area where there is a lot of wild birds as well. Now, what have we done in Northern Ireland to try and prevent this disease happening in Northern Ireland and protect our poultry flocks? The first thing was that uh, we brought in an avian influenza prevention zone on uh, the 17th of November. This required uh, levels of biosecurity and put a legal basis on the requirement for these uh, for, for these biosecurity requirements to help protect your flock. The mandatory housing measures were introduced on Monday on Monday past to the 29th of November. What this means is that basically you have to keep your birds housed. There are some species which are difficult to house. And in those circumstances where, they, where it is considered it would cause a welfare problem to house these birds, uh, if you net the birds off so that there is no contact with uh, wild birds. And as I say, that's, that's the important thing about the housing measure. Now, what we don't want to get the point across, or what we want to make sure that people are aware, is that the biosecurity requirements are the most important thing that you can keep. Uh, Dana and uh, Caroline will go into more detail in relation to the biosecurity requirements uh, to protect your flock. Okay, next slide. So basically that just covers the point I was making there. There are strict biosecurity mandatory requirements and these, these are the most important measures that you can take to protect your flock. The other thing to remember, if you're the owner of a backyard flock, that is, if your flock goes down with the disease, the disease control regulations are exactly the same as it is for a large commercial flock. It might be a pet to you, but to the poultry industry and to the department, uh, basically the actions that we will take will be the same for that small poultry flock as it will be for a major commercial flock. And the actions that we will take basically are uh, the disposal of your flock to the, to the distress of the owners. Uh, there will be restriction zones put in place uh, around where the flock occurs. And again, as I say, the, uh, the, the movement of poultry out of that particular area will require to be licensed. Next point, please. The prevention zone basically was extended there last Monday, again to cover, to require housing. And to repeat uh, the point that I was making, housing is an added protection level. It is not in place of uh, the biosecurity requirements. You still have to keep those biosecurity requirements in place. And the important things, uh, the important thing to realize is where does this disease come from? It comes from wild birds or it either comes from wild birds directly or from wild birds from the manure of wild birds so we have to prevent methods of first of all access to wild birds which is one of the reasons for the biosecurity uh, requirements in place and it, the other part is then um, we want to prevent you tramping wild bird manure into your poultry and again, that's the reason for the biosecurity requirements in place. So that's uh, another uh, string in our bow in relation to the controls of uh, avian influenza and the part that you can play in protecting your birds. Your birds are an important part of your household. And again, they need to be, need to be protected from this. 
Okay, next slide, please. Thank you. Thank you, Ignatius. Um, a brief summary there, <coughs> excuse me, a brief summary there of um, the current picture, which, as Robert and Ignatius both said, um, and just noting that um, this this webinar is one day earlier than it was last year, um, but we're much further ahead in the epidemic curve than we were last year in relation to even influenza. Um, and thanks again as well too for you know for that for that advice about um, the best you know the best possible way to to protect your flock and your pets um, is uh, biosecurity and taking those measures. And we'll hear some advice about that later on. I'm going to hand over now to um, Caroline Hall. Caroline is a poultry vet with um, Parkland uh, Veterinary Practice, um, which is going to give us a um, uh, some information on the uh, signs and symptoms of avian influenza. Um, Caroline, um, in good blue Peter fashion, has prepared a video in advance, um, and we're hopefully going to just move over to that video now. So we are, Jackie. This year again, we find ourselves at risk of a bird flu pandemic and the likes of this beautiful hen. She is at risk of developing this severe viral disease and becoming very sick or in worst case scenario of dying. So we all want to do our utmost to protect these beautiful hens and to keep disease out of our flocks here. So welcome to our webinar tonight and thank you for coming to learn a little bit more about avian influenza. It's also known as bird flu or foul plague. My name is Caroline Hall and I work in Parklands Veterinary Group Dungannon. I work with commercial hens, with turkeys, with pet hens, with fancy fowl as well. So I'm going to tell you about the clinical signs of avian influenza. But what is avian influenza? Well, it is a flu virus and it can be classed as highly pathogenic or low pathogenic. Highly pathogenic, it refers to the fact it's very severe. The signs can come on without prior warning and one of the signs, unfortunately, can be sudden death. Low pathogenic, on the other hand, is a more milder form of the disease. Birds with low pathogenic avian influenza can have mild respiratory problems, um, could have egg drop, various things like that. Now I know you all are very keen to protect your beloved hens and You'll have been watching the news and hearing about the avian influenza. You'll have heard there is an H when it's mentioned, also the letter N and various numbers. And what the H and the N mean are proteins that are on the surface of the flu virus. Avian influenza is also a notifiable disease. That gives us all a legal obligation to report it to the department if suspected, and we should do that immediately. So how is avian influenza spread? Well, it can be spread by secretions from the eyes, from the respiratory secretions from this area, from infected blood, and from infected feces. So there are many routes and to put it in perspective, a teaspoon of infected faeces does have enough potential to infect 500,000 hens. So it is a very, very strong virus and you don't want it anywhere near your hens. Faeces can also be spread by fomites. What that means is uh, little specks of faeces can be on your hands or your children's hands, your family's hands can be on your clothes, can be on vehicle wheels, can even be on your other beloved pets, say your dogs and your cats. For example, if you've taken your dog for a walk in the local park with a lake, 
and they have stood on some infected faeces. They could inadvertently carry this virus back to these hens in the coop. So you don't want that. Just think outside the box in any way that um, infected faeces could come into contact with your hens. Even rodents, very important to control them. And your feeding water bowls, they could also be infected if sitting outside. Now the reservoir of this virus is in the wild birds. The birds migrate west for the winter, for example your waders, your widgeons, and there are various flight paths which they stick to. And this virus is circulating in them right now. The map we saw a few slides ago showed cases in Europe, in the UK, in Ireland, and even some wild birds have been found in Northern Ireland this far. So what signs do poultry with bird flu show? First of all, it's really important to know the normal signs of a healthy hen. So here we have a healthy hen. She has a lovely red coat at the top of her head. Her eyes are both open. There's no discharge from them or from her beak. She's well feathered. We have a look at her legs. They're nice and clean. They're a normal colour. Now, let me go to the back end, the vent. Good girl. And it is lovely and clean. There's no sign of fecal staining. Or diarrhea. Now, the clinical signs can be different for different breeds. Uh, some breeds will show nervous signs. They will twitch their head and they will be in, uncoordinated whenever they're walking. Even their legs could have turned a colour like bruising, like a purpley colour. Another clinical sign is with the head of the hen. The whole head can swell up. The eyelids can swell. Um, the comb can go this purple colour. There is discharge from the eyes. Affected hens as well um, can be very dull. Sitting around, no energy, feathers ruffled up, just mm, don't want to move at all. Uh, they can have open beak breathing. They can have many signs like this. And as I said earlier, unfortunately, one of the signs of the highly pathogenic type can be sudden mortality. Um, so anything that is abnormal, uh, a change in the eggshells as well, a change in the number of eggs, can be signs of disease. And so, they, there are other diseases as well in poultry, though, that can show some of these signs. And it is very important to see which disease it is. There are various ways we can do that. By blood sampling, by swabbing of the throat, or swabbing of the cloaca at the back end. They can help us assess what the disease is. Um, so very important every day, monitor your hands, monitor their noise. If they're too quiet, there's something not right. Monitor their feed intake, their water intake, their egg production as well. If you have any concerns at all, contact your local vet. Contact the department as well, if you're suspicious of bird flu. Because of the notifiable nature of this disease, it's very, very important to do that. These birds are very, very special birds. We want to protect them. We don't want them getting sick. We don't want this virus getting into them or into our commercial flocks. It has a lot of uh, restrictions are put in place if it does get in, and it is an awfully severe disease. So do everything you can and we are here if you ever want to chat or get advice from us. I want to thank Thomas McAllister for letting us 
um, show his beautiful head in this presentation. And many thanks for taking the time to come and to listen. Bye bye. Thanks very much, Caroline. Um, excellent presentation um, and medium for for um, using it and brave for um, doing it with an animal. Um, thanks very much. Uh, in summary, uh, Caroline's presentation then on the side of Simpsons. I think probably something that came out last year was that you know that's important not to wait for a combination of these. You know, if your if 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 your bird is showing you know signs um, that are not normal, then you know seek veterinary advice. As soon as possible, or if you suspect bird flu or other notifiable disease, then then please contact the department. It's important that we know as soon as possible, uh, so we can help um, take action and and um, and help you. I've just made been made aware, Jack has made me aware that um, some people have some issues with sound. Uh, we've checked everything on our side, and it seems to be okay. Um, we will be this this has been recorded, and we will provide a recording afterwards as well to be available on the deaf on the data and. The website. So, apologies if you're having some issues on your side. Uh, find. So, next we're going to move on to um, Dallas Simpson from um, St David's Poultry Vet Vets. Um, Dan has also prepared um, a practical video um, on tips um, to help stop your birds getting sick um, and keeping the and keeping bird flu out. Um, and following the video, Dana will also give us an update on some practical tips on how to house your birds and. A few messages there, Dana. Come on, a few questions around housing, um, around the, the 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 types of housing that's adequate um, or acceptable as well. And we'll pick them up at the end of your presentation or uh, in the Q and A as well. So we'll just hand over to Dana. Video now, please. Good evening. My name is Dana Simpson. I'm going to try and give you some handy tips about how to try and keep your backyard flock as safe as possible. Every flock, no matter what size, has their own bug populations. The bugs live in their guts and are there to help make the bird able to digest its food. Those bugs are good bugs. However, wild birds have many, many, many parasites and bugs within them that your birds are not used to. Though some of those bugs are bad bugs. And what happens when they come into your hens is your hens are not used to them, have no immune system against them, and it can make them very, very sick. So how do we prevent the wild birds bringing any sort of bugs into your flock that could be harmful to them? There are several tips that we can use to do so. First of which is personal measures. So the handiest thing to have is a pair of wellies that you only use in the hen yard. So when you come in, you get your pair of wellies, ready and you swap over your shoes every time you enter the hen area so make sure your wellies are clean and there is no debris on them if there is a bit of muck or anything on them make sure you have a brush there that you can brush off the visible dirt another thing you could use is a lidded box now the lid is very important because we're going to put about 10 litres of water into it. I measured it out in one go and then I put a little mark with a marker so that I know exactly where to fill it up to next time. You can use either Novagen disinfectant or Vercon S tablets, whatever you find handier. Both of these are easily got. So for 10 litres of water, you only need one Verconized tablet or 25 milliliter of Novagen. A big jar will do you for a long time. Once you have your lid on, it's to protect the solution from rainwater so it doesn't get diluted and make it less effective. Once you have your solution and your wellies on, you step in. Make sure the box you have is big enough to fit you and both your feet into it. The way we do that then, it means that all areas that will be in contact with your yard are then disinfected. The same thing applies as the washing your hands against the COVID regulations, 20 seconds. So count to 20, hum a tune, whatever it is, but make sure you're in there long enough that 
the disinfectant has time to actually disinfect your wells. Once you've been in for 20 seconds, make sure you have a hand sanitizer, preferably 70% alcohol. Um, you can either have a gel that you can put on your hands or you can use a spray bottle with alcohol spray. Make sure you're disinfecting your hands. You can do that while you're in the bucket so it saves you the time. Once your 20 seconds are up, you can come out, make sure you close the lid and you're ready to enter the yard. That way you can't carry in anything that has potentially been on your driveway or anywhere you may have walked. Maybe you walk the dog or anything you may have picked up in the meantime that you could carry into your hens. Once you've been into your hens and you're finished, you come out, you make sure that you brush off any sort of visible dirt again because any sort of organic matter will make the solution in your bucket less effective. Once you have the muck off your wellies, you get in again and then same applies. Once you get out, you make sure the lid is closed and you switch back to your normal shoes. So those are personal things you can do. Easy to do, very, very effective. Another thing that you can do is try and prevent the wild birds from coming on to your yard. Now there will always be wild birds outside, but as long as your yard is not attractive to them, they have no reason to come there. Now birds carry a lot of those nasty bugs in their poop. And they only poo when they land and when they take off. So flying over your yard or being outside, they generally do not poo as they fly over your yard. So it really would be if they land or take off from your yard that could cause potential issues. Now, feed the birds inside. If you have no feed out on your yard, it makes it less attractive for wild birds. As you can see, I'm out here on my own. There's nothing around me. But should I put down something attractive, you never know what might happen. So storage of feed is also very, very important. Make sure you're storing it in a lockable bin that isn't accessible to either vermin or wild birds. Both of these can carry diseases and it's easily done. Should there be any spillage, accidental, anything like that, try and clean it up promptly. That will make it less attractive for any wild animals to come onto your farm and avail of it. Another bonus of this is that wild birds can actually eat quite a lot of food. So you'd be saving yourself a bit of money, making sure that they do not get any feed that is meant for your hens. Another problem is water ingress. If you have a pond uh, in your yard, or it's been raining very heavily and there's now a big puddle, you have to try and make sure that the hens cannot access that area. Either it's not easy to drain those kind of things, so if you can fence it off and make sure that the hens cannot access it, you still are keeping them safe. Having a pond in your hen yard is not advisable as it encourages waterfowl to come and stay in your yard and again that brings disease with it. Other options for repelling wild birds can be shiny objects such as CD, um, CDs on a baler twine or bits of uh, alufoil that you put on a string and hang off areas and they flap in the wind. Anything reflective or rustly like that will deter wild birds. It's easily found, anyone has these in the house and it can be very, very helpful, especially at this time of year. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks, Jim. Um, I'll pick up from here then. Uh, so yeah, several things were mentioned um, in the video uh, about how to try and prevent uh, the viruses and other bacteria, because this is not, it's important to remember, this isn't just protecting your birds against avian influenza. This is something that protects your birds against other diseases that are out there like salmonella or mycoplasma, other things that potentially, other things that could potentially make them ill. Now, some of the things that I'll just cover again in the, that was said in the video is that birds 
tend to make defecate generally when they land or take off. So any if your coop is under trees or if your coop is under uh, lines, electricity lines, or if there's a, a gate beside it, anywhere that potentially wild birds would be perching um, increases your risk as well as the fact that if you feed your birds outside or if there's a pond in the in the garden or in the vicinity of the chicken coop, um, if, if there's anywhere to nest or anything like that, that attracts them as well. So really keeping them away is the first bit. Another issue that can bring in unwanted diseases is water ingress into houses. Uh, we've seen that uh, your wild birds might not necessarily be on your coops or, or nesting near your coop, but if they are nesting on the roof of the house or anything like that, and there's a heavy rainfall and it washes the water down and your coop is in a lower part of the garden and not sealed properly, any, any water that can come in from outside um, can potentially carry disease with it. Uh, and we have seen several cases where that was the point of introduction uh, of avian influenza in some of the backyard flock cases uh, in GB. So really important is with this housing order, try and make sure that your birds are separate from not just wild birds, but wildlife. So vermin, uh, that's rats and mice and anything that is running around outside and can potentially carry diseases in. Um, so again, yes, yeah, some there were some questions about covering uh, coops. That's a very good idea, tarpaulin or, or any any sort of anything that is waterproof uh, and leak proof and can and can cover it is great. But don't forget the sides. So, uh, you know, not so much the higher upsides were to let a bit of air in, but mainly uh, the area is set to about half a meter from from the ground up where you can get splash or you can get uh, ant rodents or, or, or anything like that, small birds trying to come in from the side. Uh, storing your bedding, your food, your water and that indoor uh, is a great help, but make sure that it's covered and sealed and is in, in sealed containers so that it doesn't attract any animals to try and come in. Vermin are very resourceful. They will chew through plastic, they will chew through wood, they will chew through different things and your previously sealed up coop uh, becomes uh, more vulnerable. Um, so keep checking for gaps, keep checking for holes, keep checking for, uh, you know, if, there, if there's been a bit of a storm, keep checking that there's no rips uh, or anything like that. Just basically try and keep the wild stuff out there and not anywhere near your birds. If you have, um, if you own ducks and geese as well as poultry, try and keep them separately as best you can, um, especially during these times. Obviously, the, the water birds will still require access to water uh, as part of their welfare. Try and enclose it. And if you can, uh, even if you can put, you know, a, a, some sort of a, a seal around it or a roof over it or something that will prevent other birds also coming in uh, and making use of it, that will be a great addition. Um, other pets, again, Caroline, I think, touched on that as well. Make sure that your your dogs, your cats, that they can't access and run between uh, the different parts. They carry stuff on their paws and their feet and everything. Um, so again, that could be a mode of transportation of infection. Everything uh, that you can think of and can do, uh, do to the best of your ability. Keeping a, a hand spray with a uh, Alcohol um, spray is very useful for if you're suddenly bringing a bucket in or a wheelbarrow or a tool or you're you're bringing something in a box into the coop because maybe you maybe you have to fix a hole in the mesh or something like that. Just make sure that you're disinfecting anything that is touching the ground inside your hen area that may have come from outside. So either dip it in the foot dip and count to 20 or spray it make sure that anything that comes through the door is disinfected and isn't carrying anything in. It'll be in the small things like that, that, that you need to pay attention to. 
um, visitors, you know, again, change of footwear, just have some wellies that are designated for that and change into them and just keep them in the coop so that you're not, you know, that they're just, they stay there and you change into them every time you come in and make sure that everyone, the children, everybody who comes in and uses a coop or feeds the hens or helps out that they have a pair of wellies there um, and just clean them every now and then, but make sure that they at least stay in the coop as much as they can so that they're not, you're not cross contaminating in terms of making sure that your foot dips, that, that if you can see dirt, if you can see contamination, then there's a high level of bacteria in there. So that definitely requires changing, even if you've only changed it two days ago. If it visibly looks clean, I would still advise to change it at least once or twice a week uh, to make sure that it's fresh. In terms, I think there was a question there about what um, disinfectants to use. Um, there's a variety of disinfectants that can be used. Probably the handier ones for people with farms or people with um, access to, to farm shops and stuff like that would be the likes of Novagen. Uh, otherwise, something like Intercid or Intercocask. Make sure that you look. Um, the, there's on the Dara website. There's a list of disinfectants uh, that is can be used and successfully against these things. But Novagen generally or uh, the likes of Intercid or anything like that are easy. Any, any disinfectant really will work as long as you're using it at the right concentration. So make sure that you look, go to your local shop, see what they have, uh, and make sure that you use it safely. Some of those uh, disinfectants can be quite, um, you know, acidic or in chemical usage. So wear gloves when you're doing it and be careful when using it around children. Um, mix it outdoors if you can with, with some products. The, the vapor from them can be quite strong as well. So any anything you can do when you're looking at your coop, just anything you can see or do that will keep the wild birds, the vermin and water out is already halfway there. And hopefully we'll be able to keep your flocks safe and keep the Northern Ireland bird industry safe as well in the process. Jim, I'll hand over to you unless there's any questions or anything else you'd like me to cover. No, that's great, Dana. Thanks very much. And thanks to you and Caroline. Um, also, respect for your for the challenge or taking on the challenge of outside broadcasts with animals and some small children involved in places as well, too. I noticed so. Well done, and um, thanks for taking the time to uh, prepare those. Both great videos, um, very clearly said like the assigned symptoms, and then also the um, tips to keep the virus out. So I mean, we hear quite a bit that you know, even influenza is in the wild birds, and you know that there's there's, there's a certain in, inevitability about it. But you know, we can you know, we we can all take practical steps to protect our own individual flocks, and that's all we can ask people to do. Um, is to ensure that they, that they take steps at their individual level and take you know some personal responsibility for protecting themselves by, by following the advice and thanks for that. So we're going to hand over to Laura Wilson now. Uh, Laura is a dear of DO that works in County Fermanagh and she's going to give us a, a, a summary of the key points tonight and um, some key take home messages and then we'll pick up our Q&A. So if we start answering some questions now and we'll pick up and try and challenge the panel as much as we can. Thanks, Laura. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, I just start once again with a very brief introduction. Uh, my name is Laura Wilson, and I am a divisional veterinary officer in DERA over public veterinary health unit. Uh, this really, this final presentation is really just a summary of what of, has already been discussed um, throughout the course of this evening's webinar by my colleagues and my fellow panelists. So I will apologize in advance for any repetition, um, but the aim really is to reiterate a few of the more critical points. So first of all, what we need to know what to look for. Avian influenza is an influenza type A virus affecting predominantly birds, and it can be categorized really according to its ability to cause disease. It manifests itself as either low pathogenic avian influenza. We saw various cases of this back in 2019 in Northern Ireland. Affected birds 
can have really very little or no clinical signs uh, or less severe symptoms, really ranging from things like a drop in egg production, a drop in feed and water intake, and some respiratory symptoms. And the mortality and morbidity levels are really relatively low for low pathogenic avian influenza. However, there is some forms have the potential to mutate into the high pathogenic avian disease. So high pathogenic avian influenza uh, is a much more severe clinical picture. Um, this particular strain, which they are dealing with in the United Kingdom, um, the Republic of Ireland, has been confirmed as H5N1, and it is extremely virulent. Um, birds, there is a very high mortality rate. In some cases, it may be up to 80 or 90 percent. So affected birds may present with sudden death. There could be depression, lethargy. Some of them will have a watery diarrhea. Um, you'll have the usual signs of reduction in feed and water consumption, as well as a drop in egg production. Respiratory signs, as Caroline has already alluded to, where there is coughing and sneezing, nasal and lacrimal secretions. And on some occasions, it's not quite as common, but you will see a swelling of the head and a possible discoloration of the wattles and combs. And again, you can see neurological signs, so your birds may have uh, dropped wings, or they may have a twisted neck, or in coordination. Um, turkeys and chickens, so your galliform birds, are very susceptible and will show signs, whereas your other species, like your inseriform birds, your ducks and your geese, and also pigeons, don't show many clinical signs. So it is imperative and essential that if you have a backyard flock where you have both types of birds, that they are kept completely separate. So next slide, um, please. Okay, so what does we, we must do to take action to protect our flocks? Uh, we have talked a lot um, tonight, and we have talked and promoted a lot on our Twitter and social media accounts about the importance of biosecurity. Biosecurity is essential. It is our most robust line of defense against avian influenza. And it's not just avian influenza. There are other notifiable diseases, uh, Newcastle disease, is one in, in birds, um, infectious laryngeotracheitis, which is a production disease of birds and has been quite relevant in recent months. And then there's the zoonotic diseases, particularly Salmonella or Campylobacter. So if we promote and we exhibit good biosecurity and very stringent hygiene practices when we are managing our flocks at all times, not just at these very high risk situations, then we have a much better chance of controlling and curtailing disease. So we talk about structured scrupulous hygiene and disinfection. Again, this has been covered by Dana. Um, your food ups, you use DERA approved disinfectants at the recommended dilution rates in your food baths, and these can be found on the DERA website. And again, we all know about scrupulous hygiene. We have lived with COVID-19 for the last two years. So we know how to wash your hands. We know about PPE. So it's essential when we're controlling disease in our flocks also. Ensure that access to your premises is restricted to visitors who may unwittingly carry virus in on the soles of their shoes, et cetera. Management of your flock. As you all know, as of Monday and this week, the housing order came into effect which means that all kept birds are legally obliged to be housed or otherwise kept separate from wild birds. So as a flock keeper, it is your obligation to assure that the welfare of these birds is not compromised. And again, the pest control is essential in any biosecurity protocol. Feed and equipment, this must be stored where wild birds cannot access and cause contamination with fecal material and feathers. And be prepared. There is a very useful checklist um, on the DR website. Um, it's a very useful tool in order to help you review your biosecurity of your premises and also where there are any deficiencies, it gives you some very useful advice. And lastly, react to disease. If you suspect any signs of avian influenza in your birds, you must either contact your local vet or your divisional veterinary office immediately. I uh, just reiterate again what my colleagues have said. Uh, the UK Public Health Agency has confirmed that the risk of N 
uh, 5H, or H5N1 sorry, is very low, so it is, um, the risk of public health is very low. And the Food Standards Agency have stated that the risk to public health from properly cooked poultry meat and egg products is very low, provided that stringent hygienic um, measures have been followed. Even with these assurances, I urge you that um, you do not handle sick, dead or dying birds. And anyone who is in direct contact with these sick birds should use very stringent PPE and hygiene measures. Would I have the next slide, please? Okay, so this uh, um, we request really that all bird keepers subscribe to a free DERA text information system. It's very easy to subscribe. You just text birds to 67300. Um, this service allows us to give you very up to date disease information. It can assist you uh, to take informed actions in order to protect your flock. Again, it's been said several times this evening, but it's vital to remember that not only will this disease cause severe ramifications to our poultry industry and the economy here in Northern Ireland, but it is also have, can have very detrimental effects on the mental health and welfare of our poultry keepers and their families. And again, just to reiterate uh, that even influenza is a notifiable disease, you have a legal obligation to contact your local vet or your divisional veterinary office if you see signs disease in your flock. And um, final slide, please. So the final slide is a very important reminder. All bird keepers in Northern Ireland must register their flocks. Um, the only exception really to this is people who maybe keep a pet parrot or budgies in cages indoors. But apart from that, Anybody who keeps birds, if it's one peacock outside to 100,000 broilers, you must register your flock with DERA. It's a relatively simple procedure. You just um, uh, look for the bird registration form. It's called an AIPM4 on the dera-ni.gov.uk website. And this must be submitted, even if you just keep a few, um, say, turkeys coming up to Christmas or a few birds at certain times of the year, you must register your flock. And the reason for this is that in the event of confirmation of disease, um, a three kilometre protection zone and so 10 kilometre surveillance zone, as well as temporary control zones, if it crosses jurisdictions, are set up. And all poultry keepers, whether they're backyard or commercial flock keepers, will be contacted and or visited by DERA staff. And this as part of our disease control and eradication duties. It's therefore imperative that we know where all the premises are, where birds are kept. So I would just like to take this opportunity again to thank you for your attention at our webinar this evening. I hope you have found it in some way informative and that you feel much more prepared um, to protect your flocks from this disease. So thank you. Thanks very much, Laura. Um, and thanks for um, that summary. I suppose just picking up a little bit on the uh, bird registration point as well, too, as Laura says that um, in Northern Ireland, it's a requirement for all birds from one bird up um, to be registered with the department. So just to clarify as well too, this is not about collecting information for the sake of it or governments are collecting information. And we, we would use that information um, to, to communicate with you at speed through text and other services about the disease control situation in your area and provide you with advice to, to, to protect your birds. And so it's a proactive um, uh, effort by ourselves um, to ensure that we have full knowledge of where all the birds are in Northern Ireland and how we can best protect them with your with your um, help. So we're going to move on to the Q and A section now, um, and I can see quite a few questions um, have come in, um, and I'm going to kick off uh, with one here. I'll probably tie two together actually. So there's been a question around the sort of risk to uh, public health, um, um, which we don't have public health colleagues um, on the line tonight. Um, we have um, uh, we have been liaising with them very closely as this outbreaks developed across um, these these islands. So it's, it's in general the risk of public health, but a more specific question probably around um, given the recent sort of H5N1 detections in Greater Belfast and wild birds, is it still safe to take the kids to feed the ducks in the local park, or should we avoid these areas altogether? 
I maybe start off with Ignatius and then maybe Eleanor wants to add something in after that. <clears throat> uh, thanks, Jim, uh, for that. Yes, it is still safe to take your uh, children to the to the parks. Uh, now, having said that, basically follow basic fire security procedures whenever you're coming home. Uh, make sure they wash their hands before they eat anything. Again, that's just a normal procedure that they should be carrying out anyway. Uh, the important thing whenever you are bringing them to the park is don't allow them to approach any dead or sick birds. Basically, keep them well aware from that. But provided you follow basic biosecurity and the normal uh, hygiene uh, protection for your children, uh, there, there is no particular risk. And Donna? Sorry, Jim, my sound fell out there. Could you repeat the question? But it's okay, so we're just following up on, on one of the, it was a couple of questions about the risk to public health um, in general, but also was it still safe for to visit local parks given the recent findings? Um, and should we allow the children to still feed um, ducks and sort And Ignatius had picked up a little bit on the general sort of advice around not handling or approaching sick or, sick or dying birds. Yeah. Do you, know, you want to add anything else in relation to that? I think just common sense. You know, if if you're playing outside or you're you've been outside and you've touched stuff, you come in, you wash your hands before you touch your face or you eat or anything like that. Um, so say, same goes for for all uh, seasons. I, I would say, you know, I just as Laura said, if you see any sick birds or dead birds, don't go and pick them up. Try and avoid having your pets pick them up. Uh, and uh, or, or sniffing at them or licking at them or anything like that. Uh, but in terms of public health safety, I think just remember to wash your hands when you come back in um, is, is as safe as anything at the moment. Uh, Jim, if I can just add another point there. Uh, as everyone's aware, basically we have recorded cases of avian influenza in the Belfast area. Uh, this is part of our avian surveillance uh, we won't be picking up any dead birds from the Belfast area, but certainly if you see any wild birds in any other part of Northern Ireland, uh, please contact the department and uh, we will arrange uh, to pick them up again for as part of our avian influenza uh, surveillance. Thanks, Jim. Just to add to that, there's a little bit of stuff on social media appeared on my Facebook feed today. Um, Folks feeling sorry for a goose um, that had made its way into their garden and was feeling unwell uh, in their view, and it probably was, and uh, wondering what to do with it. And the answer is bring us, uh, and and we'll come and we'll have someone come and lift it. Uh, don't don't start trying to um, pet the goose or uh, look after it yourself. Um, uh, the goose needs to be removed as quickly as possible. Thank you, Robert. I, again, Robert, just to reinforce that issue, or just to make people aware, is that in some circumstances, if we decide to take the bird or whatever it is, uh, we may need to put the bird down as well. Thank you. Um, so another question here, um, just probably was was two questions probably then tied together again. So um, a little bit for Caroline perhaps, and then any others who want to add in after that. Um, it's just a, perhaps a recap on the signs and symptoms, Caroline, and, and the person thanks you for your video. But also, does the influenza present differently in different species? Um, this person keeps chickens and ducks, but houses them separately. Um, just a note that it is a requirement now of the even if there's a prevention zone that poultry and other poultry and water wild species are kept separate. Um, and thanks for that. Um, but I just want to pick up on it. So the general sign of symptoms, Caroline, and then um, does it affect different species in different ways? Thank you, Jim. Uh, the signs and symptoms of bird flu or avian influenza, they are discharge from the eyes and the respiratory area. Also, the comb can be swollen and the head can be swollen. Um, there can be sneezes, 
and coughs as well. And it can sound like little snicks even at the very start. Other signs can be respiratory distress. The legs can turn a purple color. There can be diarrhea. And the birds, again, as I said, for the highly pathogenic type, it can be very sudden. And unfortunately, you can just find them dead for no obvious reason. Um, they can be very dull as well, very depressed, unwilling to move and show nervous signs. They can be flicking their head or uncoordinated whenever they move. Now, some species um, show different signs. For example, ducks, they can be carriers and show very little signs. Hens and turkeys generally are more severe. The likes of um, pet birds as well. These are the similar signs you're looking out for in them. So it's very important to be vigilant about anything that doesn't look right because you all know your birds well. You all know their normal noise, you know their normal routine. And anything deviating from this could be a cause for concern. So be vigilant. Thank you. Jim, if I could come in there as well um, to follow up on that from what Caroline said, the, the current strain that we're seeing at this round, the, the H5N1, seems to be a very, very uh, pathogenic strain. So what we are seeing at the moment is very high mortality, a lot of sudden death, very high mortality. So it's really, really important to protect your flocks. Um, because it once it's in, that's that's it. So keeping it out really is the only way of preventing your birds from getting sick. Thanks, um, Donna. Um, just picking up on a question here. Well, there's been a number of questions, I suppose, um, around housing um, and what you know what housing means and what is effective housing. Um, I can give the sort of standard line and then I'll maybe turn to some others for some practical advice and maybe some some of the tips that Dana gave earlier on as well too. But the, the, the sort of policy line is that it is not a legal requirement um, to keep your birds housed or otherwise separate um, from from wild birds um, in, in an effective manner. Um, I think it's a recognition that not everyone will, you know, will be able to house their birds indoors. And it's what you can do practically then um, to ensure that they're kept separate from wild birds. Um, Dana, do we pick up, or Caroline, sorry, go ahead, Caroline, yeah. Hi. Um, I just wanted to make a point that if your birds are used to being outside, they a lot of them are creatures of routine. So if suddenly they have to come inside and be kept inside, an idea is to keep them in a quiet, peaceful area near a window so at least they have the recognition uh, they're not exactly outside but they still can see outside and it helps cut down stress levels because stress can have very detrimental effects in poultry as well and that is some of the questions then have been around is a polytunnel acceptable um and, you know, can I use um, mesh over over my um, coop? Um, can I use a tarpaulin? So a, a general sort of ra raft of questions around what's acceptable. And we do have some guidance um, on the DRO website as well too for people. And always always happy to take any sort of um, queries offline as well too. But Danny, you want to give some advice now? Yeah, um, I think something that's completely sealed is possibly maybe favorable on over mesh uh, for the overhead uh, bits and maybe the bits up the side against splashing and against uh, vermin or um, small birds trying to come in, wildlife trying to come in. But certainly mesh uh, around the, the side area, even for letting air in or light in, as, as Caroline uh, was saying, you know, uh, just that they're not suddenly finding themselves in a dark uh, shed when they're used to being outside. Um, a polytunnel, providing it's big enough for the number of birds you're wanting to keep in it and that it's completely sealed so that there's no, it's, it's vermin proof and waterproof, uh, then I, I don't think that should be a problem. 
So it, I think if you assess your own situation and your own facilities, what you really want to make sure is that nothing, no droppings can fall in from the top. Nothing can come in uh, from from the sides. Uh, that no water can come in. That no birds or vermin can come in, and that no droppings can come in from the top. And really, uh, you want to make sure, yes, that fresh air can come into the birds, and that they, they are as comfortable as possible. And even at, uh, as you know, um, a couple of uh, enrichments uh, can can help maybe mitigate a bit of the stress that that the lack of um roaming uh, might bring but just if it's sealed leak proof waterproof vermin proof then generally a lot of things can be used uh, as jim said there's there's tips on the dera website as well so just if you can make sure that nothing can get in from the top and the sides and the bottom um then th anything like that would work Okay, thanks, Dana. Can I add to that, Jim, please? Yeah. Um, another important thing for the hens to provide for them inside uh, is good quality litter and dust baths to help them exhibit their normal behaviour and to make sure there are perches available for them as well. Just try to, everything to keep the stress levels down. Thank you. That's great, Caroline. Um, some practical things I know we've we've gone over our time a little bit too as well, and um, we're an hour and ten minutes in, and didn't realise that um, we've been here that long. But we'll pick up a couple more questions and before we wrap up, um, to try and get through as many as possible. Just want to reiterate that any questions you don't get to, um, we will um, take away and provide answers along with um, the recording. Um, I have one here around um, the uh, housing order and I don't know whether Julian or Neil wants to pick up on that. I suppose it's just around how long um, the the so there's been a couple of questions about it. Um, it's will the will the housing order be uh, in for a similar time as last year, um, or how long will it, will the housing order be in? Um, so we brought the housing order in on Monday the 29th there, um, and compared to last year it was the 23rd of December. So I don't know if Neil or Julian wants to pick up just briefly on the sort of duration. Of the, of, the, of, the, of the housing order? Well, Jim, just that, I think the ideal would be is for a little time as possible, but it all depends on the risk level, to be honest, and how this disease progresses over the next number of months. We'll be taking a number of factors into consideration, both in terms of the veterinary risk assessment of the poultry flock in Northern Ireland, uh, and the continuing outbreak of wild bird cases and infected premises across GB and the South. So until we get a clearer picture of that into the new year, that will determine how long we'll keep the housing order in place. But we'll be working very closely with our GB colleagues, ROI colleagues, uh, and we'll be updating the veterinary risk assessment uh, regularly to, in terms of defining how long that will be. Thank you. Thank you. And any Julian? No, I'm content enough with that. Thank you very much. To see what Jim, Jim, there's a question in the chat you might have missed, missed asking about vaccinations. Oh, Maybe sorry. Dan or Caroline would like to pick up. I think it's a good question. I have missed it, Robert. Can you call it out? Sorry. Apologies. Oh, it's, it's very simple. Is there any vaccinations for avian influenza in development? At the moment, it is very difficult to plan ahead for vaccinations because, as we've seen in the past couple of years, there's different strains of avian influenza have hit the United Kingdom and Ireland. So, very difficult to plan in advance. The other problem with vaccinations is sometimes it gives a false sense of security and um, that'll naturally cut down people's good level of biosecurity, which is actually uh, 40 times more beneficial to keep avian influenza out. The other big problem with vaccinations is even though it's a good idea, then we lose our freedom from avian influenza and there's very detrimental effects on trade between us and other countries so it's just it's a difficult one but we're not going down that route at the moment thanks caroline and practically as you say it's difficult because the this flu virus like all flu viruses keep changing the one the h5n1 although it sounds the same is actually at a molecular level subtly different from the h5n1 we had in february last year which is why we know it's a new incursion rather than a carrier so it keeps moving, and uh, you know you'd you'd be lucky to hit um, 
the right the, the right strains, uh, the right biomarkers in order to get a vaccine that works this year that works last year. Thanks, Robert. Um, we have a question as well to um, do we have to register our flock in other countries in the UK, so England, Scotland and Wales? Um, so for uh, perspective of Northern Ireland, it's from one bird up. Um, my understanding from you know, collaboration with my colleagues across the devolved administrations is that you must register if you have 50 or more birds in those jurisdictions. But again, I would check the, your relevant government website of the country you're in just to ensure that information is correct uh, and what the requirements are on you for registering in that country. Um, we've got to the of quarter. Um, I appreciate that there's still some questions that we haven't got to, but I might just try and sum up there and give people um, back some of their evening. Um, so again, the questions that we haven't got to, we'll provide answers and upload them with the webinar. Um, I do apologise that some people had some difficulty with sound. I know um, colleagues in Cafe work in the background, they try and address that. Um, I think the majority of people, hopefully the sound was OK. And just to repeat that you know, the recording will be made available um, and be available to you share. So some of the key messages tonight that I took away from this was, and um, it's a word that we hear all that all too often, but it is the, the key principle in protecting your flock and protecting your pets, and that's biosecurity. Um, and those simple measures that um, Dana highlighted around excellent hygiene and high level of um, protection measures and keeping your and keeping wild birds separate from your flock um, and ensuring that you meet the requirements of the intensive prevention zone and the now housing order within that. Also being aware of the signs and symptoms um, of even influenza and reporting early, both seeking help from your private veterinary practitioner or contacting um, the department. And then, as we said before about registering your birds, so we can help you uh, protect your birds um, at, at the earliest possible as we go through this heightened risk period and, uh, and perhaps where there's maybe some uh, the, the potential for outbreaks. Uh, we have been working on a simpler form um, for those of you who have registered your birds previously and we, uh, and we appreciate that and we, we acknowledge that the form was probably more targeted at the commercial sector and we've taken some feedback in relation to that and we're developing a much simpler form. Um, so you can tell your friends and family that might have a few birds that are being put off by a long form. And there will be a one-page form available hopefully by the end of this week, and my team's been working on that. So finally, just thank, uh, thank the panel for the time tonight and in preparation, not least the excellent videos. Special thanks to your colleagues in CAFRI. Um, they're working behind the scenes. Um, they made all this happen um, from the registration right through to delivering the webinar tonight and working the technology in the background. And monitoring the, the uh, chat and the and the QA. So if you don't know, um, CAFRI is the agricultural college here in Northern Ireland and provides a wide range of courses um, of, of interest. Um, so let me thank everybody for attending. Um, let's take away those key messages around um, biosecurity and registering your flock. Um, those will be the two things that we would like you to take away from tonight, from tonight and please look after your birds. And thanks again. <laughs>